This week's episode is brought to you in part by the American Dental Association. Teeth tell a story. We know what ancient civilizations ate, drank, even where they lived, all from looking at their teeth. What story will your teeth tell about you? Your ADA dentist can help you find out and give you the tools to keep your teeth healthy for years to come. Use the American Dental Association's Find a Dentist tool to find the right dentist for you. Go to ada.org slash science mag today. Welcome to the Science Podcast for November 9th, 2018. I'm Sarah Crespi. In this week's show, I talk with online news editor David Grimm about a rise in research using monkeys. And Megan Cantwell talks with news writer Adrian Cho about the upcoming changes to standards for measurement like the meter and the kilogram. All right. Well, now we have David Grimm, online news editor for Science, and we're going to talk about monkey research on the rise. So, Dave, what have you found out about increases in the use of non-human primates by researchers in the U.S.? Well, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, uh, recently released its usage statistics. So basically, USDA tracks the number of animals used in uh, biomedical research every year, and they post a report. And this year's report, then this covers 2017, is showing a record high number of non-human primates, and that essentially means monkeys in this case, being used in biomedical research, about 76,000, which is the highest it seems to have ever been, and the trends have been inching upwards for the last uh, last few years. So what proportion of animal research is comprised of these non-human primates? So it's actually a pretty small percentage, about 0.5%. The vast majority of animals used in research are mice and rats, although they are not recorded by USDA because they're not covered by the Animal Welfare Act, so we don't have data on them. But we have data on animals like Cats, dogs, guinea pigs, rabbits, things like that. And all those animals are at lower levels wow. than they were 10 years ago. And only the monkeys are at higher levels than they were 10 years ago. I'm sure there's a lot of speculation on why these numbers are going up. And one of them must be they're needed for particular kinds of research. What kinds of research are people increasingly using monkeys for? Right. And, you know, that's what a lot of the biomedical uh, research advocates are saying, that these, these animals are really needed more than ever. You know, we've got emerging infectious diseases like Zika. We're really starting to get a better understanding of the brain, things like Alzheimer's, even developing things like interfaces where the brain can control prosthetics and all those things they say are really require monkey research. It's not the kind of research you could do in, in a rat or a rabbit or anything like that. What about drug research? I mean, there's this, been this translation problem for so long and mice and rats have been considered the culprit. Do researchers think that monkeys are going to help close that gap? Yeah, that's what they say. They say, you know, the, the reason that the vast majority of drugs that work in rodents don't work in humans is because they're so different than us. And non-human primates like monkeys are so similar to us genetically, biologically. The argument is that we should be testing, you know, making more of an effort to make sure the drugs work in them before they go on to human studies. And, you know, because we're trying to develop all these drugs for things like depression, Alzheimer's, things that really deal with the brain and you want an animal whose brain is pretty similar to ours. They're saying these animals are really going to be needed, you know, more than ever. And, you know, in fact, the National Institutes of Health is saying that the demand for monkeys is really going to probably increase over the next few years just because of things like this. Usually when you and I talk about research animals, we're talking about chimps because there's been so many regulations put in place on their use in the U.S. And that hasn't been happening with monkeys at all. Is that somehow a trade off that might have occurred? Well, that's a good question. You know, there, there is actually no biomedical research on chimps allowed anymore in the U.S. So all chimpanzees that are still in labs are theoretically on their way to being retired. And the way that we got there was, you know, NIH uh, commissioned a report a few years back that really was asking tough questions about whether we really needed chimpanzees in biomedical research. And the report came to the conclusion that, that we didn't, that they really hadn't proved to be the useful model that we thought they were. And it wasn't just, it wasn't worth the cost to use them. And so a lot of animal advocates are saying, we should really do the same thing with monkeys. We really need to take a hard look at whether, just because we think these animals are going to be better for biomedical research, they're saying that we really need to take a hard look at these animals and, and figure out, are they really better? Will they really solve this reproducibility crisis, this translatability crisis? 
or are they destined for the same path as chimpanzees where we're eventually going to see a phase out of these animals as well? So we should really mention which kinds of monkeys that are being used in the research. What what are, you know, what are the most common monkey research animals? Yeah, the most common are macaques, especially rhesus macaques. Animals like uh, baboons make up a very small percentage. Uh, so it's mostly, it's mostly various species of macaque. We can't not mention marmosets. There was another story a week or two ago about their use in research and how that's been changing. Right. And the interesting story with marmosets, which actually only make up a pretty small fraction of the monkeys being used right now, but they're really becoming in demand for a lot of genetic research, a lot of transgenic animal research. And the idea is the demand is, is actually so high for marmosets right now that it, we can't, the U.S. actually can't meet supply. And some biomedical researchers are worried the same thing's starting to happen for other monkeys as well, like rhesus macaques, that because the demand uh, for, you know, cures for AIDS and Alzheimer's and things like that is so high that we actually don't, as many monkeys as we're using, we actually may need more. And uh, are we, are there enough available for the type of research that scientists want to do? So we kind of have a bunch of different things happening. We're seeing a lot more use of monkeys in research, even perhaps demand outstripping supply. And then there are people who are not happy about this and who are probably going to try the same route that they took for chimps. So what's next? Well, some of the animal advocacy groups really want Congress to put pressure on agencies like the NIH, really force them to take a hard look at these types of studies and whether they're really needed. On the other hand, biomedical researchers say, you know, the public wants cures. I mean, the public has made it clear they want cures for AIDS. They want cures for Alzheimer's. They want cures for depression. And and they're basically saying... You know, the public can't have it both ways. You know, if if you guys want these cures, we're going to need to use these animals. So, you know, this is a this is a fight that's likely to probably get worse uh, in the coming years. All right. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks, Sarah. David Grimm is the online news editor for Science. You can find a link to his story at news.sciencemag.org. Stay tuned for Megan Canwell's interview with Adrian Cho on upcoming changes to international standards on measurement. This episode is also brought to you in part by Ops Genie. Incidents happen, and they require complex coordination between operations and software development teams who are putting out fires every day. That's why getting alerts immediately is critical. Thankfully, there's Ops Genie by Atlassian. Ops Genie empowers dev and ops teams to plan for service disruptions and stay in control during incidents. It also gives teams the power to respond quickly and efficiently to unplanned issues and helps to notify all the right people through a smart combination of scheduling and escalation paths that account for things like time zones and holidays. Better yet, Ops Genie allows for deep flexibility in how, when, and where alerts are deployed with over 200 integrations like Jira, Amazon, CloudWatch, Datadog, New Relic, and more. Plus, it tracks all activity and provides useful insights to improve future incident responses. With Ops Genie, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. Visit OpsGenie.com to sign up to get a free company account and add up to five team members. That's OpsGenie.com, O-P-S-G-E-N-I-E.com. Never miss a critical alert again with Ops Genie. This episode is also brought to you in part by the NSA. Almost every day we hear something on the news about a cyber attack. Sometimes it's just some pranksters, but more often it's a foreign country with vast cyber resources trying to hack the power grid, the banking system, or the military's information networks. The National Security Agency plays a big part in protecting the country from cyber attacks, and you can help. The NSA is hiring technical professionals to serve on the front lines of information security. If you work in computer science, networking, programming, or electrical engineering, you can help keep the country safe. Design new hardware systems and networks. Write faster, smarter programs. Protect America's critical infrastructure. Or help uncover what its adversaries are planning to do next. Learn more about careers at the National Security Agency today. Visit intelligencecareers.gov slash NSA. That's intelligencecareers.gov slash NSA. For a vast majority of the world, excluding the U.S., Burma, and Liberia, the metric system is the official system of measurements and weights. Staff writer Adrian Cho is here to talk about how an upcoming meeting in France the 26th General Conference on Weights and Measurements 
which occurs about every four years, may shake up how we define measurements that have been used for hundreds of years. Hey, Adrian. Hi, Megan. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Very good. So this is the 26th conference that's being held. Are there usually significant changes that occur to units every single time they meet? Well, usually there's either a proposal to change something or there is an update. Uh, But this one is a pretty significant one in that not only are they changing say, one specific unit, but Mm -hmm. they're they're reconceptualizing the entire SI system. What are the units that are set to be redefined or reconceptualized? So there are seven base units in the SI system, and four of them are going to be redefined. And those are the kilogram, the mole, the Kelvin, and the ampere. And the other three, the second, the meter, and the candela, which is a, a measurement of the brightness of light, had been, been redefined in much the same way earlier. Gotcha. So let's go into more detail about how each of these units will be defined. Currently, the kilogram is defined as the mass of a cylinder of platinum and iridium stored in the International Bureau of Weights and Measurements. So how do they plan on defining the kilogram now without this physical reference? Yeah, so... It's tricky. And the best way to explain it is to explain what they did in 1983 in redefining the meter. Mm -hmm. Up to 1983, you had seconds that were defined one way and meters, which are obviously different and were defined independently. To make their definition of the meter more precise, they would change things around. And what they would do is that they would define the speed of light to have a precise value, right? So there'd be no uncertainty in it anymore. So they set the speed of light as a constant exact number and then they were able to turn the meter into something that you could actually go out and measure, and that would be the standard meter. So they're doing something very similar with a kilogram, except that they're defining a constant called Planck's constant, which uh, shows up in quantum mechanics. And basically, if people are familiar with it at all, it's because the energy of a photon or a quantum of light is given by Planck's constant times the frequency of the photon. And it turns out that if you define Planck's constant, then you can turn things around and you can measure out an absolute kilogram with essentially an electrical balance. And so you would replace this one slug of platinum iridium, which is the kilogram, with these electrical balances of which there are a few around the world. So now instead of defining the kilogram by this physical reference, they're dividing it in terms of Planck's constant. That's right. That's completely right. But how is this going to change in terms of experimentation and measuring things out? I mean, it's going to be pretty complicated, right? It is pretty tremendously complicated. Even the people who are involved in this admit that it's complicated, right? So the speed of light thing is pretty easy, right? You know, you get this idea, okay, if I define the speed, then, you know, all I need to do is figure out how far light travels in a particular given time, and then I've got the meter. But these so-called kibble balances that are used to measure out the kilogram are a lot more complicated But the fact is that if you have a kibble balance, right, uh, and it's well-tuned, you can knock out a standard kilogram weight very easily, right? So this makes the system much more flexible because you don't just have that single reference. If you have a well-defined kibble balance, you can make your own reference weights. And so that's the idea behind this. Did people have other propositions on how to redefine the kilogram? Well, there are other ways that you could conceive of doing this, right? I mean, you could conceive of saying, I'm going to define the mass of the carbon-12 atom to be some tiny fraction of a kilogram, and therefore a kilogram is equal to the mass of some gigantic number of carbon-12 atoms. The reason they didn't do that, one is that counting up all those atoms is really, really hard. And the other reason was exactly because the Kibble balance works by bringing in these quantum devices to measure electrical resistances and voltages. And those techniques are exquisitely precise but they're not actually part of the SI, right? They're sort of these techniques that have been invented outside the SI and have never been brought in. I mean, some people have complained that the redefinition is going to be really confusing and really hard to get your arms around, but there are sort of specific practical reasons that they did it this way. So now moving on to some other units that are planned to be redefined, what's going to happen with the Kelvin? The degree Kelvin, which is the absolute temperature scale, It used to be that there's one very specific temperature called the triple point of water at which water, liquid, vapor, and solid can all coexist. And that temperature was defined as 273.16 Kelvin. 
And so if you wanted to determine what a Kelvin was, you had to set up an experiment that held water at that temperature, and then you would divide whatever temperature you got, however you were going to measure it, by 273. And now what they've done is they've just find this thing called Boltzmann's constant, which always relates to, say, the temperature in a, of a material to the amount of thermal energy in it. If you know Boltzmann's constant, you work through a bunch of math and you can get the temperature. And the beauty of that system is that it's no longer tied to the specific temperature where the definition would be most accurate. Who are the proponents for these changes and who are the people that are kind of pushing back and saying, this could cause a lot of confusion. Maybe we should think of another way to redefine it. This has really come out of the metrology community, right? They have developed this consensus that this is a much more reliable system. But that said, even the people who are strongly for this and who've been working for more than a decade to get the precise measurements of the constants that you'll need to fix them, they admit or acknowledge that this is going to be a little bit tough on people, right? People generally learn about units and weights and all that uh, in middle school. Right. And it's pretty easy to understand if a meter is the length of a meter stick and a kilogram is the weight of <laughs> this particular weight. But when it's tied to some constant in quantum physics that people have never heard of, it's going to be a little bit harder for them to get their heads around. Yeah, it takes a lot more background knowledge to even understand that. So if those changes will, like you said, they most likely will be approved, how long will it take for them to be implemented? Everybody I spoke to is pretty sure that this is going to happen. One researcher told me that they've already they've already scheduled the party. <laughs> so so it seems likely that this is is going to go through, but the, the world will get about six months to get used to the, the new idea. It must be said, most of us never deal with this. We don't worry about what how a second is defined or how a how a meter is defined. Right. Because the the value itself isn't changing. It's just the conceptualization behind it. So it's not like people are going to have to go buy new like scales or anything like that. Right. That's absolutely right. So what they did is that they put in well more than a decade worth of effort to try to measure the different constants that they're going to fix now to exquisite precision. Because once you fix them, there's kind of no going back. Planck's constant will have this exact value. And so they couldn't have five groups around the world measuring this thing with wildly different numbers, right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they all had to converge. This was actually supposed to happen back in 2014. Mm, and okay. uh, General Conference on Weights and Measures then looked at this and, and said that the numbers weren't quite ready. They weren't quite ready to fix the, uh, the constants. And so now apparently they are. So that's why this is happening now. Yeah. So this has been an undertaking that's been going on for many years, but are there more changes on the horizon after this big one? What's next afoot is a reconsideration of the definition of the second. In principle, it will still be defined as some gigantic multiple of the oscillations of radiation from a particular atom, but just which atomic transition is used in which frequency of light is going to be changed. That may happen as, as soon as, as 2030. It's not for a little while. <laughs> it's going to be a while. But at the same time, you know, obviously science keeps growing. And one of the things that the folks who do this, this sort of work have to be open to is, of course, people invent new units, right? The metric system was born shortly after the, the French Revolution, and a committee in France got together and they defined the meter in the kilogram. But back then, those were the units, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all these other things have come, uh, have come since then. Right. All right. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, my pleasure, Megan. Adrian Cho is a staff writer at Science. You can find a link to his piece at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, or you can listen on the science website. That's sciencemag.org slash podcasts. To place an ad on the Science Podcast, contact midroll.com. The show is produced by Sarah Crespi and Megan Cantwell and edited by Podigy. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, thanks for joining us.